And um, Jeff Lawton, can you tell us um, about him and as a teacher? Jeff Lawton, who's he? I've never heard of him. I'd hate to recommend him because uh, as I don't know him, he could be a bastard, you know. Um, <laughs> how embarrassing for you. <laughs> No, I'll use that bit. <laughs> no, no, he's a good mate of mine and uh, has been from early on. I always thought he was a good student and uh, he turned himself into an excellent teacher. Yeah. Okay. Not, not better than me, but possibly very little short of being as good as me. <laughs> well, I'd always been interested in some degree of self-sufficiency. Organic farming always seemed to make sense to me and, and natural elements and hunting and fishing were always things I did from very young. And, and so that whole He's idea... A good fisherman. Yeah, that whole idea of looking after yourself in a natural way and looking after the environment was close to me. And then I was always concerned and, but never had any access in England. And when I emigrated to Australia, this word had just started to really start to buzz and become popular and, and I, I got involved, saw an advert in Grassroots, uh, uh, an alternative magazine and, and just signed up for the course. I didn't really know what I was letting myself in for at all. That, that was a very <laughs> early course, wasn't it? Uh, September 83, yeah. yeah. And, and what influence did Bill have on you when you did, did the course? Once I get my claws, you know, I've got much choice. <laughs> I was, I was actually a little bit sceptical, actually, at, at, at once at the initial stage. I, I wasn't sure about too much. I thought it was uh, quite radical, and I questioned that Bill could actually um, re have that much information to share. Uh, but I was proven wrong, and I don't like uh, feeling guilty about uh, having the wrong sort of. Uh, thoughts about people go ahead feel guilty well I did <laughs> when I realized that I checked you up I thought I, yeah. s I see what whether it's all it sounded so radical and I, I checked the facts and figures and I was proven wrong every time and I thought I better listen really carefully to what this guy's saying he went and got his notebook back from where he'd thrown it away you know yeah well I actually thought I'd better take notes now I better listen carefully even if it sounds really, really <laughs> radical, and t well, I learnt later that Bill has armories of improbable truth, yeah, which I shock do. people. I and save them up, <laughs> and that works. So, what makes a good permaculture student? Do you think? Oh, I think somebody who really takes a lot of notes, thinks about it, challenges a lot of it, and uh, is willing to teach. I think they're the best, but. Most people don't teach. I suppose about two in a hundred would be good teachers. When Bill moved to Tyalgum and put in the food forest in the five acre site initially, I went to visit because it was much closer to where I was living, only three or four hours drive. And as I walked up the driveway, before I even got to the house, I felt like reprimanding myself for not putting in the same amount of rampancy and plant control systems. I realised straight away, I didn't even get to the house and I felt like kicking my own ass for not doing what I really wanted to do, what appeared to be too contentious. And I thought, no, I'm never going to compromise it. That was it. I'm never going to compromise again. People come staggering out of my garden, you know, sort of ripped about by thorns and stuff. And I come up to the house, I remember a woman coming up and saying, where's your garden, you know? <laughs> I said, you've been treading on it. <laughs> And they always carry a handful of ginger, because ginger forms on the surface. And they go in line and they say, oh, somebody left their ginger here, and so they rip your ginger out. I think now, as, as times get more and more difficult, and, and, and you know, it sort of gets more and more stormy out there, we're like the only island that's worth landing on. And, and they're kind of circling us yeah. and, they're, and they're debating and they're very close to shore now and they're just about to surf a wave in and land on us I think and, and realise that we're actually central to everything that's going to happen in the future. And I was privileged to go working for the Cuban government on, on um, 
helping them with water harvesting issues. Everybody was back on horses and horse transport, and they're trodden around with uh, little back axles recycled out of cars, mm. with little differentials and little car seats on the top, and they're trodden along quite quick as transport systems. And uh, animals have all these wonderfully beneficial byproducts, and they reproduce themselves where cars don't. They have terrible byproducts, and they and they just cause a mess, and they don't reproduce themselves. You end up with a bigger problem. More what? the sound of the farts and the smell of the farts. There's a nice brown bum bobbing along in front of you. Burp, 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 burp. But yeah. what, what about our cities? What's going to happen to all these huge monoliths? Just a lot of farts. <laughs> no, seriously, come on. Oh, that's serious. I'm serious. I mean, little, the streets will fill up to maybe the third floor with farts. Um, no, but they're going to be very strange habitats, some of those. Yeah, I so they're think, gonna mouldy well, down into I bat caves myself, and strange things. I, I I offered to rent uh, uh, a hotel in uh, in Texas because it was the sea was rising inside the basement and it they abandoned it. So see, obviously it's a crayfish farm. You turn them into crayfish farms? Yeah, of course I would. What about po overpopulation or population on the planet? What, how, will this stay Crayfish on? eat anything. <laughs> crayfish, think crayfish. Crayfish will eat people. <laughs> oh, but definitely. <laughs> no. I did, I'd, I'd like to say when I, I, when I was setting out and thinking I was gonna, I thought I'd better put a bit of effort into helping things and permaculture was uh, obviously what I, I'd intended to engage in as much as possible my whole life. I thought I'd better ask a few, I think carefully about some questions to ask Bill. I went down to see Bill down at, the, at Talgum and, and, and asked him two questions, two pretty quick questions. He gave me two quick answers. <laughs> I said, well, how do I know if I'm doing the right thing? And he said, if resources keep gathering around you, and a lot of them will be people, you're doing the right thing. So I thought, right, I'll go away and think about that. I'm pretty sure that's a good answer. And I said, well, how do I know if I'm going to teach? And I, I think I can teach. I need the courage, but I'll get there. How do, I, scary how do I know if I'm, I'm, I'm a good teacher? He said, well, one, your students will do, will do what you're teaching. They'll become active, but particularly, you're going to have to produce teachers and you're going to have to produce at least one teacher within the first 350 to 400 students and then you're going to have to teach it, produce them quicker. So I set out, that's, all right, that's, my, that's my target, I set out for that. I got one within 125 and they've been coming downhill ever since to about one every 50 or a bit less maybe. But I'd like to think I'm on at least one every 50 now, pretty quick, they're into teaching. And I, if I slow, if that starts slowing down too much, um, I'm going to let let the others take over, and I'll go home and keep farming. So Jeff's a better teacher than you are, Bill. <laughs> now I'm trying oh, to keep up with him. Nat naturally, <laughs> I think. Ask Jeff. He'll tell you he is. <laughs> Jeff, are you a better teacher than Bill? No, and I never will be. <laughs> <laughs> Because, he, because the longer you've been doing it, the more you have to teach. And the longer that you've been doing it, the longer you've been thinking about permaculture, and the more you realize you don't know about it. And no one's been thinking about it longer than Bill. And that's quite obvious when you, you listen to the lessons that Bill has to share. So Bill, Follow that through. I'm the person who knows the least about it. So Bill, how much don't you know? Nearly all of it. More than anyone else? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, now, there's a, uh, a long way to go always, and, and new doors opening, and your vision changes, you know. Yeah, like, nature presents accidental things to you, and you look at it and think, oh my God, why didn't I, you know, plan that? It was great, I did, they did it the other day, you know, to me. And, and there's some of the really exciting events yeah. in your day. Mm. <laughs> The puzzles that appear. What an idiot I am. I've seen that before and didn't take any notice of it. I'm an idiot. And there's, 
so much more to learn, isn't there? Yeah, and it's almost the everything. Le learning is great. <laughs> uh, you know, when you learn something, you know, to increase your yields or something, suddenly doors open. It looks better. Uh, but but all you know about it is that there must be lots more doors shut. Mm. Lots of things you didn't take notice of. And there's still plenty of stuff to discover. You know, oh. every age thinks they've got it all figured out. Not true. Anyhow, we're doing all right for, you know, for a start. But as more people and more uh, intelligent people, we're not intelligent people, we're just a couple of rough types. And uh, more intelligent people get on the board. You know, things will speed up a lot. I call myself a rough ass mainframe designer. <laughs> <laughs> well, how's that? Because I can see mainframes, but the next few generations, they'll see into the future of design. I can't do it. It'd be weird if I could. Hi, Jeff Lawton here. And this is a very sad time because Bill Mollison the father of permaculture and my teacher, my good mate, mentor and, and in the last few courses that Bill taught, my co-teacher, Bill's passed on and he's left us with an incredible legacy, the permaculture design system, which is really a, a revolution I believe it's an evolution. It's the evolution of human thinking. It's the way we can turn things around. Instead of being the most destructive element on earth, we can be the most beneficial, the most productive, but environmentally recreative. We can be the element that repairs the earth while we supply our own needs. And this is what Bill's left us with. And this, this is the turning point. This is the point when we need to make a decision. Are we going to do this? Are we going to use this incredible design science that begins with ethics, this ethical design science? Are we going to use this to repair the earth? so it can go, go on indefinitely for the future generations. We have the capability to create such an abundant living system, a system that's presently in unimaginably, unimaginable. Or are we, are we going to carry on in this destructive mode, not really caring that our actions are going to create an absolute catastrophe, a disaster, a situation we really don't want to really understand because we'll perish and the earth will perish with us and that's not civilized, that's not development, that's not intelligent. I think this is the time when all caring, thinking people need to jump on the team of permaculture and, and, and get this done. We don't need any permission. It's always been, as Bill called it, peaceful sedition. You don't need authority. We can do this for ourselves. No one's going to come along and do it for us anyway. It looks, it looks like we are going to have to do it for ourselves. We can. We can turn all the principles into directives to act, and that's what Bill wanted. Bill always used to say, doesn't matter how much information you have, information that is not acted on is useless. We need to take action. We need to go into action. Many of the people in permaculture have contacted me and said, we feel more committed now. We've got to get this done. So let's do it. Let's get on with it. Let's fix the world. 
Let's create that abundance that we know is possible, even though we can't even imagine it. Let's do it for ourselves, let's do it for our families, let's do it for our community, and let's do it for the future generations. The children of the world deserve it. I look forward to being on the team. Because we either get this done, or the lights go out forever. And that's scary. But when you're on the team, you're not afraid. You're just charging at this thing with a warrior mentality. We're going to charge at it till we get it done. What was or is your motivation for practicing permaculture? Uh, well, it's very simple. Uh, it's anger and actually fury. Fury I have no other motivation. Fury about? Uh, the senseless destruction uh, that we're visiting on the earth and, and the way people in poverty and hunger are treated. Uh, the global monetary system and its ignorance. And just generally the fact that we could do so much better and we don't. We just ignore what's happening, and so I'm very angry. If you look at the perm development of the permaculture movement over all these years, you, I mean, you created the, the term. Um, what's the direction it's going into, you think? And do you like uh, that direction? Oh, it never did have a direction. It, I describe what it is like as fishing. You teach a group, tell them to go teach. Off they go, they teach groups. You don't know who they'll teach. You don't know what they'll do. So they, they did it very successfully and they're still doing it. So I say it's going on every continent. It, the direction is going towards the sea surrounding it, then it has to stop unless you're swimming. So that's the only direction is always onwards. Mm. And sometimes you might have to go back a bit. But not often. Are you happy with with that with the, with the state of permaculture today? Uh, I don't have any feeling about it, but uh, one of gratitude, because uh, such a lot of people I know, because they write to me and phone me and send me messages, that are out there doing what I used to do, and I'm just grateful. That's all. Hmm. And what's your future wish? Do you have a future wish for permaculture? that it continues and it perfects itself. Mm. As I see what I started as the beginning of something that should happen, it won't be me who can finish that job. I'll, I'll be dead, I'll be maggots, you know. How would you define permaculture to a child? To a child. I suppose the simplest thing you could say is it an attempt to build a good place to live, to live. What's your estimation of the actual state of the earth today and do you believe that humanity will be changing, will be able to, to, to deal with those challenges? Well, I agree mainly with, with people investigating the uh, condition of Earth. You created this word permaculture. Uh, can, can somebody practice permaculture without ever having heard of the word and how do you deal with it? I did. It, it comes from two roots. Per, uh, permanence, to persist through time, and culture an activity that supports human existence. So put those together, it's a persistent system that supports human existence. It's what I told the child, isn't it? Making a nice place to live. Now, uh, we've never done that, really. 
made a nice place to live. We've always destroyed things. And there's very few old systems. The Efigo in 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 the uh, Philippines, been there 5,000 years on their rice terraces. You could say they've created a permanent thing and they're still there. But I think they'll go soon. There's too many outside influences coming in. Um, uh, somebody has told me their grandmother has packed permaculture. I thought, clever woman. <laughs> <laughs> what he means is she grew her own plums and um, made her own jam and all this stuff. And I, so did my grandma. And so did everybody's grandmother who was in the country. But they... Pentecost is something entirely different. It, it has to deal with the monetary and legal structure in which you're living. We set up our own legal and monetary systems. It has to deal... Um, with the efficiency of your housing and of your settlement. And your grandmother never dealt with that, I'm afraid. <laughs> Nor does Mr. Mr. Holt. So. <laughs> mm. um, they fall short of being... That's my answer to you. People who say they're practicing Pentecost they just want an easy way to say they can. It's laziness, sheer mental. It, they're not disciplined and they're mentally lazy, right? About Fukuoka again. Mm -hmm. So you, you've met Fukuoka? What, what do you think about him? We uh, like each other very, very much. We, we walk together in, you know, forests and things, talking to each other. And we're the same underneath. He said that. Uh, He, he's a little bit angrier than me, a bit older than me. Mm. I like him. Mm. Fikaraka basically is a scientist, philosopher. He's a bi biological scientist. Um, I thought The Once Through a Revolution was the best book I'd ever read. Mm. And I advised all governments, I did reviewed it everywhere I could, and I advised all governments to print it and give it away free to farmers. Because it's the only book that sort of started to think about farming. And nobody knows what, and, and well, everybody's missed what Fukuoka did. Fukuoka collapsed time. And, you know, if somebody says they're a permaculture, like their grandmother was a permaculturist, You know, what she didn't have was any subtlety that Fukuoka did have. And so what he did, instead of ploughing, planting the crop, letting it ripen, harvesting it, ploughing, putting in the next crop, he simply sowed the next crop into the mature crop of the one he sowed before. He slid time over time. So it wasn't a pause between crops. Crop, crops went down, crops came up. Fantastic. And he's still the only person I know who includes time in every aspect of what he does. Hmm. The first person to design anything in landscape was very probably a bloke called Yeomans who set out a key line system for catching water in landscape. Uh, there's never been a book in agriculture on design. Now, if that doesn't make the hair stand up on the back of your neck, it ought to. Every book on agriculture says, you know, round about May you plough up and put 10 pounds of seeds to the acre and keep them cultivated and, and take them off, you know, at the end of J June. It's all, do this now, it's all one-dimensional. Uh, Permaculture is multi-dimensional, and one of the dimensions we use is time. We learned that from Fukuoka. The permaculture is the first book you'll ever read on design of any system. And it's about design of agriculture, design of housing, design of your financial system, design of your legal structure. Um, and I found it extremely eerie 
that there was no book on the design of agriculture. Hmm. How do you uh, think about or estimate the danger of genetic engineering and, and the pat patenting of, of seeds? Well, it's, it's a grave danger to uh, everybody, particularly the people doing it because they get paid much too much and they eat much too much and they all die of heart attacks. But, but then we'll be rid of them. Um, but it is part... You, what, what you're talking about is a result of a strategy applied by Henry Kissinger. And let me tell you what it was. He said, if we move food onto the commodity market and we can trade to and fro in it, we can own it because we can buy up the interest in it. And if we control food, we control anybody. We don't have to go to war or try and persuade them. We, we've got them by the short and furry. Further, if we can invent seeds, which they can plant once but never again, then they have to buy those seeds from us always. And that's what you're talking about, I think. Mm. So you're talking about a control strategy devised by Henry Kissinger and practiced by the American government. You can decide yourself whether you'd like to be controlled or not. So how can we deal with that danger? I mean, how can we confront Oh, well, I suppose you can assassinate the American government. Um, well, we did, see. We were, we were out there when, and we heard Kissinger. And we, so we all started to save seeds that were not, uh, were not uh, tampered with. And we set up seed banks and seed libraries and now we have access to more um, re reproducible seed than, than ever in history. Because we were frightened that Kissinger would ruin the world's food supply and he would have without us. Some of my lady farmers in Africa grow 36 sort of sorghum and keep it all carefully set and so on. So in the permaculture system there's more seed saved now than there ever was previously in history. So we're not worried about kissing you, we're worried about all of you people who don't save seed. You won't survive and you're already under the control of the American government. And we look at you and feel sorry for you. But not very sorry because you never did a fucking thing about saving yourself. I mean, if, if you are a sheep, you should be sure, slaughtered, surely. Mate. What, is, uh, what is the situation in Australia, actually? Is, is there a GMO food there or how, how is the laws there? I, I don't know, I just know it about uh, uh, I, I can speak for Tasmania. Mm. They've got they've put a moratorium of two years on GMO food, and they've extended it for another six. Uh, other states have other. Some states have banned it. Uh, some crops are going on trial. Some GMO crops. But mostly, they couldn't sell it. Nobody wants to buy it. So, and that actually is the whole problem. Nobody wants to buy it. So it is labelled if if it's if no no it's no. You see, and this in America it's not labelled. No, but in Australia if, or in if you buy anything from America, you don't know yeah. if it's GMO or not. In Australia, there are only certain crops that are GMO. I, I think canola oil is one. Mm. So we we never buy that because mm. you couldn't buy any. Oh, it wasn't genetically altered. Mm. I saw this film, it's called The Future of Food, and uh, it's about this issue, uh, the, the, also the patent, patenting of food, and mm. they said that Monsanto went into government seed banks and took normal seeds, not GMO seed, but just any seed, mm. and patented them. That's true. A and that's true? So how about those permaculture seed banks you, you spoke about? Are, are they safe, or are they patented, those they're seeds? They're ours, or? they're ours, they're not. They can't come in and take them. So you don't feel like I have to patent now every seed I, uh, I'm saving? This no, we couldn't afford to.
Because hmm. I'm, yeah, I'm, that's well, what I'm we worried looked about, at it you know, that we take... couldn't afford to. Uh huh. Okay. Hmm. It's really expensive to do that. Yeah, right? very expensive. I like it or not, a GMO crops have spread, and uh, it, I don't think you can find any corn anymore that, that isn't genetically old. It doesn't contain some of the genes that were put into corn. Um, so the damage is done for some crops, but nobody wants to buy that stuff. Nobody conscious. If it was marked, you can't sell it. So the reason why most Australian farmers don't use GMO seed because they don't see any market for it, quite rightly, there isn't any. As I, I've said to people, if I say to you, I have here seed grain with the assistance of a lot of very dangerous chemicals, and I have here organic seed, which one do you want? And I'll say, I'll take the organic seed. And only a maniac would want to eat the food produced by dangerous chemicals. On the other hand, I think that everybody who grows it should eat it, and none of them do. Neither the farmers who grow that sort of food nor the people who work amongst it eat it. They've all got home gardens. And the people who don't ask questions about it should be force-fed it. What's the plans for your personal life in the coming years? Um, my plans are to try and finish writing some of the things I want to write. I don't know if I'll do it. I don't have that one, I suppose. And otherwise, you know, live a good life, quite well. A good life to me is having a garden and your friends and eating food that you want to eat. Are you going to travel a lot, you think? No, I just about finished. Probably this is my last long trip. I hated travelling and I didn't start it until I was 54. I love where I would live. And... Uh, I felt it was a duty, uh, and I was angry. Hmm. So, though I'm still angry, I think I did my duty. Oh, if any other individual does their duty as well, we'll have the whole earth covered. Mm -hmm. And I have students of whom I'm very, very proud, and to whom I'm very, very grateful because I'll finish the job. Uh, you know, looking after life systems, looking after people, and returning any surplus we have, material or information surplus, back to the system. It's a little difficult to define what the permaculture community is. It's not a community which has a hierarchy. It has no administration, has no paid offices. Um, a lot of people find that extremely annoying. It's bigger than the United Nations, the FAO, WHO, and most of the national aid agencies put together. And doesn't cost anything, and there's no administrative cost. So it's pretty weird. <laughs> the other weird thing about permaculture is nobody claims to know what they're doing. <laughs> so there's no uh, sense of you know exactly what you do. But if, if what you do turns out okay, you don't have to do anything. So there's a sort of koan for you. You don't know what you're doing, but if you do something all right, then you're not doing anything. And it is totally uh, disintegrated. You own the word permaculture, the completion of this course, as much as anybody does. And nobody can tell you what to do or what not to do. So don't let them, you know. There's no kings or king. There's no royal family in this system. Okay.
So now we move on to the principles of natural systems and of design. Design is a curious thing. It's a word in the English language which is not in a classification of any library. You can't go to the library and say, I want to look under design. Doesn't matter what classification is used, it's not there. If you ask people to define design, particularly designers, they don't have a definition of design. And there is, there is none. The only definition of design comes from engineers, and uh, that's an interesting one. They talk about incremental design. You, you make a water wheel and you measure the amount of energy you're getting out of the axle compared to the uh, energy in the water falling across the wheel. And you play around with that wheel for uh, 200 years, altering the curves of the blades, the number of blades, the spacing of the blades. And eventually you get up to a very high degree of efficiency, about in, in an overshot wheel, 93%. And you can buy that design. Uh, and that took 200 years to get up to there, but to get up to 94% would take another 100 years. It's got to be a lot of insight. And the water wheel, overshot water wheel, is the world's most efficient mechanical device. There is nothing as efficient as that. Incremental design has been defined by engineers, and that's what it means. You make something like a car engine, and you know you get five miles to the gallon and you keep playing with the damn thing and altering materials and injectors and, and you get up to you know 45 50 miles to the gallon and then suddenly there's a leap and you get 130 miles to the gallon or something but uh, but you, as you get close to the limit of efficiency of the fuel the possibility of increase uh, is very slight I want to talk about design. There's only been one real set of principles evolved for design. I'll give them to you now. Everything really is connected to everything else, in fact. And a good designer uh, puts many elements of design to work to support a single important function. If you want to heat a house, you see how many ways you can achieve that till you've achieved a satisfactory amount of heating. But it's basically a fail-safe system. You can heat a house eight or ten ways. You can build it to be heated by solar heat. You can heat it as Bruce's place is by collecting heat on the roof and fanning it on the floor. You can heat it with radiant heat from massive stoves. You can heat it by troll walls. You can heat it by composting up against the rear wall. You can heat it by putting a flat roof and heaving, heaping your hay on top and radiate heat from the ceiling down, as the Turks do. You can heat it by lifting it up and putting all your cap and hay underneath it and letting the heat come up through the floor like they do in Yugoslavia. And you can, you know, just hundreds of ways to heat a house. But, but you know, it's not the, the number of ways you heat it is not so much important, is that you use sufficient number of ways that the house is self-heated. So design is truly important. It's the single most important aspect of human settlements and the production of food from farms and of the farms themselves. We will show you designs which can double or quadruple crop production uh, and no fertilizer can do that but design can do it. So uh, then lastly, every element you place in a design should serve many functions. And none of those should be intrinsic functions. You don't put in a tree and say, well, it gives shade. Of course it gives bloody shade. Everything that gets in the way of the sun gives shade. That's an intrinsic function of a tree. So it should perform functions because of its placement. A good designer can place an element to do five things at once. And uh, that's a super design. And if you can give three reasons why those windows are here, why are those windows there? And they're good reasons, not intrinsically to do with the fact you can see out or it lets light in, which all windows do. 
person we can see is coming up the path or something, um, then you're a good designer. And uh, I was thinking of some things we went around today, you know, I thought, oh, I was performing two or three good functions. I've forgotten what it was or where it was, <laughs> but, but, you know, it's easy to place a pond, so it has at least five good functions. And this discussion on design is unique to permaculture. Design, I say, has two, two elements that you recognise. One is aesthetic. A lot of people who are designers go around making beautiful somethings. And the other one is functional. There's no conflict between those things. A functional design can be as beautiful as a non-functional design. And um, permaculture design is the first system of conscious functional design in the world. That's its unique aspect. It's true, people say there's nothing new about permaculture, so that's right. Nothing new about permaculture. There's really nothing new about anything. But functional design is a new aspect of this particular discipline. And uh, functional design exists in very few areas of human endeavour. Engineering come closest, I guess. It's drifting away from its base to... Um, we c we uh, concentrate on function under the box of those ethics. Function design is sustainable. We're early to use this word which has been stolen by all sorts of idiots. There's one amazing, um, uh, were you there, Scott, at that, in Texas that time we went down to, we went down to a meeting on, function, on sustainable agriculture hosted by Texas Department of Agriculture. The room was full of people from universities all over. Everybody worked in sustainable agriculture and uh, they said we could attend, we could sit around the walls of class and listen to their debates. It was sweet of them and they gave us a thick sheaf of paper on what they're going to talk about and then they invited me to speak and everybody knows that's a pretty fatal thing to do really. <laughs> so I said I held up their thing and I said this is full of bullshit, this big thick issue they had. And they said, yeah, we know that we were going to change it. So they excused that. I said, okay. They gave me 10 minutes to talk. And I said, what I want to know is, how do you define sustainable? And here are a lot of people from universities and ag, ag colleges and things working in sustainable agriculture. So the, the answer was not forthcoming. You know, then I did, uh, uh, you know, I am a very rude person. I took off my wristwatch. And I set it up there and I gave him four minutes to answer and nobody had answered. They were all whispering to the secretaries, you know, what is sustainable, you know? <laughs> I said, okay, we've now established you don't know what is sustainable or what the word sustainable means and you can't define it. And I said, well, the last question I have for you is, do any of you have an example of a sustainable agriculture? And then we gave them another four minutes and I couldn't answer that question. I said, well, I don't think we have anything to learn here. You're here to talk about something you cannot define and of which you have no example. So what can you teach anybody? A uh, sustainable system is any system that in its lifetime can produce more energy than it takes to establish and maintain it. So it's really a different way of thinking about your whole damn life, actually. It makes a lot of sense to use your uh, group power. If you can't do that, you're dead. <laughs> if you can't Sorry. work together, I don't see any real chance of a reasonable future. There is no such chance. So... You either co-invest or die, cooperate or die. It, but it is the same in nature and everywhere else. What if our individual cells started to argue for independence from each other? We wouldn't last long. Yeah, something like that. That's, 
Yeah, cancer is equivalent of getting rich. Um, functional design should have a good product yield or a surplus yield of product. It's there are lots of you've got to stand back from something like food to see it. You know, if we have uh, at least three million hectares of lawns in America. Those lawns take more fertilizer than all of your agriculture in totality. But they use a lot more horsepower than the agriculture does. Uh, and they use most of the biocides, weedicides and sprays. So your lawns are larger than all of your agriculture, including the agriculture of India and Africa. Uh, so now, don't sit there and tell me you can't grow your food in your cities. You can. You can grow your food in your settlements easily. Yeah, there's an unforgettable moment when you wander around. I was addressing a crowd in Bristol and I said, you can all be growing your food where you now got your lawns in England. And they said, oh, we couldn't do that. And besides, you won't get the English to change in that. Old, old woman stood up and said, if you'd been here in the war, we changed in weeks. <laughs> <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as they started to torpedo all our food and we got hungry, everybody went out, dug up their lawn, and within six weeks, mm -hmm. we were eating our own salads, and within 12 months, we were feeding ourselves. I said, so take no notice of this idiot, she said. <laughs> yeah. You can change, and you will change. Uh, it's always nicer to change in a voluntary way than in that involuntary way where you're at the brink of starvation before you see the need to change. You will change. We will all change. Now, in, so when you want to test if there's a good design, you say, why did you put that there? And it doesn't matter what it is. It can be a door, a window, a dog, a tree. Why is that there? And you have to have a, a three or four bloody good reasons for it. Uh, and what essential functions is that component supporting? So what you're doing, you're putting together living machines, machines in which people live. Nothing may move may not be a machine with a moving part, which is mechanical, but the sun moves, the wind moves, water moves, and it may intercept those movements skillfully to provide you with all your needs. So it's a biological machine. It's a, a living, a place that will respond to the elements to protect you so you can live there. Now, if you've got an oil electric home and I clip the wires, you can't live there you can't even live inside the house. Your toilet won't flush anymore, for one thing. You have to go outside, light a fire, and get in a tent. Right. Product yields are basically about 4% of us keep all the rest of us running. All essential services are covered by 4% of humanity. That's stretching it a little, probably 3%. It's not really an essential service to get a massage. Um, so all your food can be produced, all your energy systems maintained by a very small number of people in your community. Or you can rotate through that function, so you have to spend two years of a hundred year life producing food you know, sort of, what's the word, national service. It takes you one day in a bush mill to cut uh, all the timbers for one house. So one day in your lifetime you make care to make yourself a house. Two years in your lifetime you make care to uh, feed yourselves for life. That is no cost further cost of feeding you. Now, I doubt whether you could actually work up to three years. We'll give you examples later where to earn your income for the year costs you at least five days a month. 
we'll be, to be talking about those systems. So most of the time, people are going to work, nine to five sort of work, <coughs> they're not doing a damn thing, really. Just make work. And most school teachers know they're running a vast babysitting system. That's all they're doing. Yeah, carrying little bits of paper one to the other. <laughs> Trying to make it look important because you've got to supposedly work an eight hour day or a nine hour day for a five or a six day week. So you've got to appear to be busy. If you didn't have to appear to be busy, you could go home most days. Um, so most of us are out there trying to look as though we're busy and, and on, honestly what we do most of the time is make work, make inessential work. But, but that means that only 2% of us gardening at any one time can easily feed all of us and it's a trivial exercise, it's not difficult at all. It would take you about half an hour to teach somebody to plant how, how to plant six months' food. It takes them 40 minutes to plant it. See how long it takes you to go down to Walmart and come back. <laughs> so in the same time as it takes you to go and shop at Walmart, you could have planted six months' food and never go back to Walmart again. So it's trivial. It's a trivial exercise to design energy efficient housing. There's so much of it now, it works so well, it's really trivial. We're not talking about things which are intellectually difficult or physically difficult to do. And if you've got your gardening over with between, say, the ages of 18 and 20, and spend an extra day and cut yourself a house, or made enough bricks to build that house, and that takes one day for a two storied house you more or less finished work as far as housing and food goes. And if your house is energy efficient, you'll finish work there. So then you think, what can I really, what did I really want to do with my life? <laughs> Certainly it wasn't sit in some, some oversized car crate, uh, paying it off your whole life. Is that what you wanted to do with your life? No, you know, you can't imagine possibly what it is you would like to do with your life. Certainly uh, not paying off rubbish. It's rather amusing to think about a house. You know, your great-grandfather builds a solid brick house and uh, he dies. You decide, you know, as is eight of you, you'll sell the house and take the money, so you do. Then someone comes along and they have to buy the house. Meanwhile, it's going to cost them more than what it cost your great-grandfather because uh, it cost him very little. <coughs> so he, he, they charge double for it, so they pay for it double again. But what they're getting is exactly the same house and it's slightly deteriorated. And then it goes on sale after sale after sale. If you talk to land agents, they'll point to houses which they personally have sold eight or nine times. And every time it costs more and more and more. And those houses which start off at $9,000 in Grandpa's day get up to a quarter of a million dollars. Same old house, been paid for a lot of time. <laughs> it's called a pyramid scheme. It, it, it is. It, you know, you have to draw back from it all and think about it because why in the hell would you ever pay for anything again? Your, your great-grandfather paid for it. You, you don't have to pay for it. But if you want to go on paying and paying and paying and increasing the amount you pay, you spend your whole... Generations of people spend their whole lives paying for things which were paid for when they were built. Except in some cultures they don't. Like, you know, just back from Austria, people live in the houses their great-grandfather's built. You know, they don't pay any, a penny for that house, you're just born into the thing. You know, there's 20 or 30 of the family live there, they've always lived there the last 5,000 years. The house doesn't cost you anything, your job doesn't cost you anything. It's all there. 
and it's about all to end. Uh, so we had it right. You didn't waste your life paying for something which took, you know, less than a year. My grandfather built a house for a bet in two days and it's still standing. For a bet? For a bet. <laughs> yeah. It took me a week. <laughs> All fellows are pretty cluey. Um, now, when you look at a whole system, there are two things very undesirable in the system. One is work and the other one is pollution. But as soon as you see work, you will get pollution. Pollution is a product of work. Work is a result of not supplying any com every component of your system with its needs. You know, let's put that in way. If you didn't put a tank on your chicken house, you've got to carry water to the chickens. So you incur work when you've not designed a way in which the components of your system can attend to their own needs. Now, if you don't collect the eggs from the chicken house, that's pollution. So pollution is an unused resource. It didn't go somewhere where it would be used. So, but if you collect the eggs, they're no longer a pollutant, they are a resource. And so it goes. So work and pollution are both faulty design symptoms. So that, that will lead us later to methodologies of design. Again, design has not been defined by people. We've defined it here. We design for functional relationships in whole systems that will save energy. Uh, if we fail in design, we'll incur work and we will certainly incur pollution. I live in a fortunate place because not knowing what I was doing, I put it together as best I knew and I can go away for eight months, nine months, come back, it is simply better. Nothing has gone wrong, nothing is causing pollution, it is simply better. So it's quite a pleasure to go away because when you go back say, wow, that is a lot more jackfruit. <laughs> um, so, if you are even reasonably competent, you can design six in which work finishes and pollution finishes soon after you start. You have to put in energy to anything to start it, anything. And after you've done that, it should last a long, long time without any further work. That's why I'll, we will we'll stop or we'll go down the hill one day and we'll look at a swale put in here in 1933 and it's functioning as good as the day it went in. And all over America these constructs, the CCC constructs, are there quietly functioning. Nobody's ever made any rehabilitative work on them. So I think they'll probably last for another two, three hundred years. There's some uh, water systems in Spain have been used in irrigation for about a thousand years. They're still functioning extremely well. So some systems you can build will have a very long duration. If by the way you had, when they put the swale in, they put a line of olive trees along it, they would simply be getting better in the next 800 years because an olive tree will last as long as a swale. We can locate olive trees, which we think are older than a thousand years, and they're in good condition. And three trees will provide all your lighting, all your cooking oils, and all your soaps and uh, shampoos for a family. So do you have time to put in three olive trees in your whole life? It's a whole six or eight minutes job. 
Uh, I put several hundred in this year, just in case I miscalculate. I never trust, <laughs> never trust my calculations. Really, very funny thing to do. I bought this cattle farm, and at the time, uh, cattle worth about eight hundred dollars a head off farm, but it, they went down to a hundred dollars for a Hereford cow and calf recently because of drought. But I, I, you know, generously left it at eight hundred dollars. The, the farm had fifty-six cattle on it. So I got I kicked the cattle off. I was going to put fifty-six things worth eight hundred dollars there. It ended up as being twenty-four sticks of bamboo, mm -hmm. are worth exactly the same. Sixty mango trees, worth exactly the same. Yeah, uh, mango bears about a thousand fruit, worth two dollars each. So every tree, every year, is worth as much as a cow, but you don't have to hoot it about and cut hay to it. <laughs> You just have to go and pick the mangoes up. So I went on like that, you know, a quarter of an acre of, of silver perch is worth the same price as all those cattle uh, on 175 acres. So suddenly I realised I was about to get filthy rich. You know, I put in 600 mango trees, not 60, I put in thousands of bamboo, you know, I could, I could find 58 fish ponds. Uh, so who wants all that money? I mean, I could be in deep trouble. I mean, I could get awfully insecure if I had all that money. <laughs> I might even have to uh, employ a security service or something. Guard my mango forest. <laughs> So then I thought how shockingly uneconomic it was to run cows. It really blocked a lot of people from making money. And that's a fact. Yeah. As a design, it's designed for destruction. It is. It's a kind of way of retaining ownership of large areas of land without actually doing anything at all, except turning cows out and getting some back occasionally. It's a, it's a way to mark your land. You brand the cows and let them go where they are, that's your land sort of business. It's not really any way to treat country. When somebody says, I'm keeping cattle, I say, well, you're working at the bottom of the trophic level. <laughs> you know, you, you, you're, uh, you really don't make much out of doing that. <clears throat> okay, so you can get an awfully good product yield if you think it out, and if you cost it out, you can be very economical with very small expenditure of effort. Granted, you have to wait six years to your first mango crop. This was my first mango crop. I remember meeting a friend years ago, I said, what do you do, is it growing lettuces? And I said, well, hell. <laughs> he said, yep, every week I put in enough lettuces for a week. And I said, that's bad luck, Bob. He said, well, mm, don't know. He said, I worked it out. Uh, while I've been growing lettuces, I've been planting trees. And he said, in year three, I can stop growing lettuces and pick my first crop of fruit, and that year I'm a millionaire. But every year thereafter, I'm much more than a millionaire. And that's exactly what happened. He used his lettuces to buy his trees, plant his tree, to supply cans with tropical fruit. There was no other supplier. And the first year his fruit came in, he was a millionaire. And stopped growing lettuces forever. You know, you've got to think about what you're doing, where you're going to go, how you want to spend your life. You know, whether you want to spend your life planting, you know, 50 or 100 trees, or whether you want to spend your life running around after cows, you know, hooting and yelling and cracking your whip, you know, forever. Or whether you want to be relatively affluent or relatively poor. 
had a, a, a marvelous trip a few months ago. I went to Vietnam. Vietnam has instituted permaculture as its official agriculture. It's its total. Uh, sustainable systems as its official policy. Uh, farmers I met, uh, I remember one man, Mr. Meyer in the Delta, he said our family was sick, uh, we're under communism, we had to produce rice, and so all we produced and all we had to eat was rice and salt. We were all ill, we had very little energy. I said rice is not a food really, you know, you just forget it. I said okay, well then we were told to become permaculturists and now five sorts of carp, I've got prawns here bigger than crayfish, you know. I have, we hardly eat rice at all, it's a shit food. I said, yeah, we'll just send it to the freaks in the West. They think it's good food. It's actually it's starch, you might as well eat starch. Um, that's white rice. I said, export it. He said, I'm, not, I'm gonna give it right up, it's just not healthy for people. And he grown um, sweet, sweet potatoes as a ground cover, perennial ground cover, digs all he wants every year, but it's still always there, you know. He's got uh, about six-tier agriculture with, you know, coconuts up top and uh, vanilla beans and stuff got over coconuts, coffee dotted along. And, uh, he got 400 square metres. He said, I am now a rich man. I said, how do you define that? So, well, I've got a radio on a bike and a black and white television, that makes me awfully rich farmer in Vietnam. They said, I've got all the time in the world <laughs> and lots of excellent food. And I said, he said, I feel rich, I'm very wealthy. So he said, I've been able to lend money to my neighbours, farmers, other poor farmers. I've been able to bring them here and give them all sorts of plants to take home which will put them in the same wealth category as me. And I've been here, I have some of them here come working around with me, young farmers. So I'm teaching them exactly how to get rich. They said, nobody's sick in my family anymore. We have an excellent diet, you know. So, you know, it made me very happy. And he was in his fourth year from rice. So when you design well, there's neither work nor pollution. When you design well, Another thing which is also extraordinarily intriguing, when you design well, <coughs> nature takes hold of what you've done and does it better. All you've got to do is watch the system and guide it slightly. Uh, if you make a mistake to start with, it compounds as time goes on. There's a lot of jargon in ecology and in design, we'll uh, discuss a few things. Resources is used often, we've discussed sustainability, you know what sustainability is. Any system which conserves or generates the energy it costs to build and maintain it. Something that can make itself. Now, Mr. Mars farm, because it's there, can make lots of other farms. So it can go on building farms just like itself year after year now. So it's hit the criteria for sustainability. And it's a wonder of connections. He feeds his pigs, they crap in the canal. <laughs> the prawns eat the pig crap. You know, on goes the water, the carp eat the algae, it goes through clean up marshes and goes back into the stream it came from. So you know, the whole thing is really connected right through this whole huge 400 square metres. Yeah, <laughs> 400 square metre farm. 20 metres by 20 metres. Yeah, it's a reasonable farm for the Delta. Uh, resource is uh, energy stored in a useful form. Now there are enormous fluxes of energy through all uh, all real world systems. The sun comes up, comes over, goes through. Rain falls, water runs through your system. So how are you going to store those energies in a useful form? And if the sun heat is in your floor and radiating softly all night or through the dark days of winter, then it's, you've made a resource out of sunlight. 
if the water is in a 10,000 gallon or a 20,000 gallon, two 10,000 gallon tanks under or near your house, you've provided your water for the year from the water that was running away of the landscape. If you stop it in the landscape and put a sub-irrigation under your forests, you will never have to water those forests again. So it's what, what are you doing to make resources? There's a, a funny little diagram in the bottom, <laughs> it really is. There's a source of energy wherever it is. There's your site in the middle with that little network. Uh, resources coming through your site. How many storages can you set up? Useful storages can you set up? And, and if you do a fairly good job there, then your work is finished in a way. And there are other things will help you set up storages, beavers, mm -hmm. unpaid slaves, you know. <laughs> as far as water storage goes, you know, just give me four beavers rather than a bulldozer any day. Try to tell them where to put it, though. No, no, you've got to take it where it goes. <coughs> take it where they put it. Where yeah, it's going to be where water can be held. That's where they'll put it. But it's real easy to feed them. You can just get a great sheaf of poplars under your arm and go stick them in along the creek, you know, and that's it forever. So you just got to feed the slaves a bit. Don't put your apple trees where the beavers come, and they don't go far from water, it's just really close to water. Put your apple trees a little further away than the beaver go. So you're, what your job is to set up as many resources, useful storages within the system as you can. So your, your resource creation is your job. Um, how are you going to turn waste products into resources? These are all, all thoughts you've got to have. When people first started to think about natural systems, they saw a relationship between the diversity of the system and the stability of the system, whether it would continue. Obviously, this hill from top to bottom, down till we get down with fences, is totally stable, you know, self-reproducing, self-maintaining system, which generally slowly enriches itself. As soon as we cross the fence down there, uh, we're in a totally different system. So what are the factors that make one uh, a system that builds resources and one in which resources are slowly trickling away. The oak trees are dying, the gullies are eroding, the streams are increasingly polluted. Uh, is it just the diversity? So they said there is a relationship between diversity and stability and uh, a mathematical symbol you would use for that is a curious little squiggle. The diversity is in some way related to stability. Uh, there's no doubt there is a relationship. A diverse system generally doesn't collapse as disastrously as some form of monoculture. And we have lots of real life examples of the collapse of oversimplified systems, like the Irish potato famine, which is sort of the first time in history that people really relied on one crop for their living, you know, and of course it, it not just. Crop. Well, indigenous or not, you know, never in history have we actually ever before relied on a single crop and not necessarily their fault. They're at the same time producing under contract to England plenty of wheat. They didn't have a famine, they just didn't get the access to food, that's all. They died. What is that relationship? And uh, I think people still uh, can argue about that. Diversity of species, uh, the correct term for that is the richness of the system. That's the correct ecological term. When a system has a lot of species living in it, it is a rich system. When there's few species living in it, it is a poor system. And uh, richer it is, in some way, the more stable it is. 
but then we've considerably modified this, you know. I, I think I was one of the early modifiers. These are all totally different components of a design system. You can make them uh, any shape you want, you know. Is it the number of different things in the system that is a stability, or is it the beneficial relationship between these things? So is it, is it the number of these or the number of these? Number of these or the number of these? It's really the number of beneficial connections that impart stability. So that means you can get stability with relatively few components in the system. And you can get more and more stability if you can think of more connections to add. So it means you can sort of, you know, if you've got good connections here and there, some of these can break, the stability of the system will apparently be unaffected. It will be weakened, but you would never notice that it was. So, um, it's the, the way the interactions go that give a system the stability, not the number of things in it necessarily. And yet, I think, back, going back to richness, in all systems, there are two levels. The system can get too poor, and then goes all on its own to extinction, and it can get too rich and goes all on its own to a sl uh, slightly simpler but more functionally integrated state. And both those things happen. We've got evidence for both in nature. We have evidence that systems left alone, like some of the sand dune country we have, slowly degrade to, you know, sort of impoverished shrublands. Uh, deserts, which were overcleared and start to leak badly, wash off and run away, slowly degrade to true sandy deserts. And, you know, they're on their way. Leave them alone, uh, it's too late to leave them alone. Leave them alone, they'll just go all on their own, they'll run down to nothing. Australia's been described uh, by some ecologists as a, a leaking continent. <laughs> leaking continent. It's like a tire with a constant bleed in it. It will just go flat all on its own. So much nutrient, so much silt, so much dust is being lost in the continent that if you don't interfere now, it will just quietly go down to total desert. It will proceed in a sense, to abolish itself. Which is exactly what's happened from North Africa right down around the Mediterranean.